Hello. How are you guys getting on? I can see that some of you have managed to turn up already. Um, for the person who asked how often are we doing this, um, we are basically going to be doing uh, one free YouTube session for biology and chemistry uh, once a week. So I'll be doing some different, um, <laughs> just seeing an interesting comment. Um, I'll be doing a different biology tricky topic, which you guys chose a little while ago, um, basically every week. How are we getting on guys? How are we getting on? Let's have a look. Everyone good? <laughs> no? Everyone just quiet? Yeah? Hey, thank you, Shanelli. Um, yes, Aisha, I'm sure you'll be fine. I'm good, thank you, T-Boy, thank you for asking. Um, I have been in London today, which has been pleasant. You guys are tired. Bioessays are such fun. Bio essays are actually all right. I always found for those of you who do AQA and everyone else, will just, you can ignore this. The biology essays are actually not too bad just because you can basically say a load of stuff. And yeah, I was thinking about this, Shnelly. This whole snap revised dealio, this is really good with coronavirus. Like it's almost like, well, it's pretty ideal for us because more of you lot hopefully are going to need some lessons in the near future. <laughs> not that I'm endorsing it or anything, but you know. Uh, anyway. Uh, okay. I OCRA people, yeah, you're lucky you don't have essays. But as I said, they're not too bad. So uh, my plan today then is to have a look at haemoglobin in the heart. So I think I had about three or four people um, kind of questioning how this stuff sort of works. So I'm going to start off looking at the heart, actually, I don't know the other way around. I'm going to start off looking at the heart, how that's controlled. Then we're going to look at haemoglobin, because I know some of you don't really need to know very much about haemoglobin. OK, um, anyway, could I do a video on how to answer a nine marker? Uh, feasibly, although I don't want to promise that because I feel like that's quite niche. Um, what example is this? This example is everyone. So uh, this is what I'm planning on doing. So we're going to describe how the heart functions, describe all the different sequences of events, and then we're going to look at haemoglobin dissociation curves or dissociation because people get a bit confused with them. Um, and then for those of you that are interested, and feel free to come and have a look at this at some point because this will be on YouTube forevermore. Um, these are the spec points that we are going over, right? So I don't know why it's cut up here, but have a have a look through it basically as as you come to revise this and just tick things off as you go. So if you feel like you understand the gross structure of a human heart, then awesome, you've done that one thing. If you know how hemoglobin loads, perfect, you've done that. Okay, uh, so there the AQA spec points. OCR is essentially the same. Um, the only difference is you've got something about hemoglobinic acid, but very, very small. Um, and then edXL A and edXL B, again, very similar. Um, the only difference is edXL B don't care about dissociation curves. So you guys don't have to worry about the curves where you get this cool sigmoidal sort of shape. Um, I'm only doing these three. So, uh, sorry, these four. So AQA, OCR, edXL A, edXL B. Um, with EDUCAS, I don't even know if that's how you say it. Uh, if I'm totally honest, um, I don't know. I don't know much about that. There's a good chance I'll cover some of the spec points that you need to know. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Uh, LXLA, yeah, they don't have uh, um, dissociation curves. What else are we saying? Um, SAN and AVN, yeah, I'm going to look at SAN and AVN. Will this include cooperative binding and the Bohr effect? Uh, yeah, I'm going to talk a bit about that. Not loads about it, but a little bit, Martin. Um, why are there so many examples? Yeah, weird, isn't it? I've actually, I've wondered this before. Um, there was an idea a little while ago to sort of scrap all examples and just have one central thing, um, but it never happened. But I reckon it will one day because it just makes everyone's lives easier, right? Um, anyway, so starting off then, we are going to look at uh, the hearts. I guess there is a money element to it. I am going to talk about fetal haemoglobin too, yes. Um, so in terms of the heart, before we get started looking at the cardiac cycle, probably worth reminding you um, some just a, a few little things. So you guys are all expected to know that the heart is made of four chambers. So you've got uh, two atria, there and there, two ventricles, here and here. Uh, you need to know the names of all the veins and arteries going in and out. So you are expected to know uh, that you've got the superior vena cava, which is the vein that allows uh, deoxygenated blood in. And you've got the inferior vena cava that allows it in from the bottom of the body. That blood will essentially move into the... Um, Oh, yes, into the right atria. So you've got to remember that this side is actually the right and this side is actually the left. It's as if it was being held up to your chest sort of thing. So it's as if you're looking, you're looking at someone facing you. So this is the right hand side of their heart and the left hand side. Uh, blood moves into 
the uh, right ventricle basically gets pumped up along him and it will go through the pulmonary arteries, which will go to the lungs, goes to the lungs, gets oxygen, becomes oxygenated, comes back through the pulmonary vein into the left atria, gets moved into the left ventricle, and then basically out of the aorta. Okay, so we'll start with that because I assume you guys know what I'm talking about here. Um, if we go a bit further then, so the cardiac cycle I've written at the top is the beating of the heart and it is separated into two or three stages. Okay, so depending on how you've been taught this, it is either diastole, and some of your teachers will call it diastole, but it is properly pronounced diastole, and there is something called um, systole, which is separated into atrial systole and ventricular systole. Uh, what are you guys saying? Hang on. We'll always cover everything in the AQA specification, yes. Do I have videos on WJEC? Uh, I don't think so, no, sorry. Uh, relaxing is, yes, relaxing is diastole. I'll get to that in a second. Is it worth you coming on a crash course if you do the WJEC? Honestly, I don't know. If you look up, I'll talk you through the, um, the crash course in a bit. If you're covering the same things that I'm covering, then yeah, why not? Anyway, um, so what can we say diastole is then? What can I say that diastole is? How can we describe it? I'll have a sip of coffee while she tell me. Good, it is the relaxation of pretty much the entire heart. Okay, so diastole is a uh, relaxation. Of the heart. Lovely. So yeah, it's the atria, it's the ventricles, it's basically all of the muscles. Uh, when this happens, so I'm going to start off this, this first page here. This is just about diastole. Okay? I'm not talking about uh, systole at the moment. This is all diastole. So where is blood entering from? Blood is entering from what? <laughs> Partuma, if, uh, if I had advice on that, uh, all I can say is work hard, right? Just study a lot. Good. So blood is going to come in through the vena cava. Anywhere else it's going to come into, Olivia, you know too, pulmonary vein. So blood enters the two veins, so the vena cava and um, the pulmonary vein there, and it's going to enter into the left atria and the right atria. So blood enters through vena cava into the right atria, just by putting that in, and through pulmonary vein into left atria. Okay, so yeah, this is during diastole. So the reason for this then is what? Why, why is it the case um, that blood can enter these two things? How can, how can the blood move in here? Yeah, good. So it's always moving from a high pressure to a low pressure, right? So I think this is one of the key things to think about uh, in terms of the heart, is blood can only ever move from a high pressure to a low pressure. So it means at the moment that the pressure in a uh, the heart is going to be slightly lower than the pressure in the veins that supply the heart. Okay, so it's all to do with uh, pressure differences. One thing that I have forgotten to mention is what happens to any of the blood that does enter into the atria. So any blood that enters into the atria is going to go where? Good. Yeah, so it's going to go into the ventricles. So any blood that comes in, and not all of it, but some of it, will start to move into the ventricles. Okay, so little trickles of blood are going to move through. Not all of it just yet, but little trickles will move through, which tells us that the atrioventricular valves, these guys here, and if you need to know what side is what, um, this side is the tricuspid, this is the bicuspid, and I've always remembered that because you learn to ride a tricycle before a bicycle, but um, blood is going to enter into uh, the ventricles too, right? The reason for that is because there is a higher pressure in the atria, because it's filling up with blood, than there is in the, ventric in the ventricles. Okay, so blood is going to start to enter uh, the, from the vein cava into the right atrium, from the pulmonary vein into the uh, left atrium, um, and I'm also going to say and into ventricles because 
um, there is a pressure difference. So um, let's just say yeah, there is a pressure difference. with atrial pressure being greater than ventricular pressure. Out of interest, what is the arterial pressure going to be like? Those are the specific names for the AV and... Yeah, yeah. So atrial ventricular is like the general word you can use. Um, bicuspid is a more specific one to tell you which side you're looking at. So arterial pressure, not atrial, arterial here. Less than that for ventricular contraction. Olivia, what do you mean? Did I? No, I haven't. I'm just writing R here because this is right hand side. Sorry. There you go. Right. So if I've got a little bit of blood in here, right, then my arterial pressure, if this is really low, then it means that the ventricular pressure will be higher and that would force blood out. At this moment, that is not happening. And this is quite easy to remember because during diastole, the ventricles have only just um, contracted. Right? So they've just contracted. So the pressure in my arteries is still going to be pretty high. So arterial pressure at the moment is actually going to be greater than ventricular pressure. And that's important because it means that the semilunars, which are the valves here, are closed. OK, so the semilunars are closed because basically there is a higher pressure in the arteries than in the ventricles. OK, that's what's uh, closing it. And that actually makes a noise. So your heartbeat, um, the, the term we tend to use is lub and dub for the two beats of your heart. Um, when the semilunars close at this moment, we call this uh, the dub, which I've always remembered because D for diastole. OK, so lub, dub. Uh, lovely. Can I show you this on a graph? I will show it on a graph. Yes. So that is diastole. If we move on to atrial systole, what does atrial systole mean? Lucy, I'll get to that as well. What does um, atrial systole mean? Cool. Not contraction of the heart, contraction of atria. Okay. What is the pressure like or the pressure differences? Lovely, guys, look at all those comments coming in. What is the pressure like at the moment? Where is it high? You can't tell me it's high, you gotta tell me where it's high. So Lucy, high in the atria, higher than where? Higher than the ventrals, good. If you ever talk about pressure, and this is the same way of xylem, phloem, lungs, you have to say it's higher in X than it is in Y. Okay, if you don't do that, you will lose marks. So pressure in atria, greater than ventricles, okay? This means, and I didn't actually say it in the previous slide, but this means that the AV are still open and the semilunars, I'll get to in a second. Um, if the pressure is higher in the atria, where is blood gonna move? Septum is this line down the middle here. Good, blood moves to the ventricles. What is the point of doing this? If some blood is already moving into the ventricles, what is the point of this? Hang on. Uh, yeah, so gravity. Good, yeah, this is just making sure that all of the blood is filling it. Exactly, Olivia, you're exactly right. You make sure you are filling it as much as possible, okay? Um, Aisha, good question. Why is the atrial and arterial pressure high in diastole? The atrial pressure was high here because it is filled with blood, right? If it's filled with blood, um, think of it like gas pressure. The more stuff you fill it with, the greater the pressure inside, so it's higher than the ventricles. And the reason the pressure is great in the arteries is because the arteries have just had a whole load of blood go through them. The arteries tend to be at quite a high pressure anyway, right? So they'll be like recoiling and doing all that sort of thing, okay? So it's, it's a cycle, so it doesn't matter where you start. So diastole, um, followed by atrial systole, where you have your contraction, semilunar is still closed, um, atrioventricular valves open. And then finally, uh, I've got ventricular systole. What happens to my ventricles? Uh, Aisha, yes, the pressure in the arteries is normally very high. However, the pressure can get higher than it. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to pump anything out. 
So the pressure in the arteries is pretty high, but you can just about get it higher. So good, ventricles contract. Uh, pressure in the ventricles, how does that compare to anywhere else? Good, so ventricles are gonna be greater than um, the arteries. And we can also, the arteries are greater than the atria as well. You don't need to add that little bit at the end. But this means if my pressure is very high uh, in here, because it's basically squeezed, all of this blood is going to come shooting up. Uh, what happens to these atrioventricular valves? They snap shut. Good. They close. This makes the lub sound. So when you hear your heart beating, it's not the muscles you hear contracting, it's the uh, valves open and closing. Semilunars, they do what? Semilunars open. Lovely, otherwise blood wouldn't be able to move out. Causing blood movement uh, out of the heart. Okay, and that is all there is to diastole. Why does it close? That is a good question. So these valves have a shape which is said to be cusp shaped, right? So you've got, uh, let's say you've got a little tube like this, right? If blood, if there's a high pressure here, then blood can just move through these two little uh, cup shaped things it will open up like that right if it's the other way then if there's a higher pressure to the opposite side here basically all the blood will collect there and there and because they kind of open like that they just get pushed together and they physically can't move there's also a whole load of tendons connecting to the side of the heart as well which is going to stop them from inverting so they can only open in one direction okay so if the pressure thing is easy to remember, if this contracts, pressure there is higher, right? If this contracts, then the pressure here is higher than everywhere else. And if nothing is contracting, this thing happens to fill up with blood anyway, causing the pressure there to get quite high. So are they concave? Um, you could argue they are concave in, as ter in terms of their shape. Um, the, ten the word you tend to see is cusp, right? Which is like an old word for cup. Okay, uh, what is the optimum pressure for the closure of valves? Oh, pfft. there doesn't need to be an optimum pressure. It just needs to be uh, a higher pressure on one side than the other. Okay, uh, so as a graph, and this is probably what you guys are used to, you have uh, three different lines representing different things. Say, a, so the aortic pressure and just arteries, uh, the pressure in arteries in general, uh, ventricular pressure and atrial pressure. So at number one, um, let's say that number one is like this section here. Right, where is the pressure higher and therefore what valves are open? Martin, it causes quite big effects. Like it's not good. So for one, during atrial systole, um, and this is obviously gonna look at it in a bit more detail. So you can't just assume that atrial systole, this one's always open, this one's always closed. Uh, at the moment, my atrial pressure is higher than ventricular. So which one's open? If the atria has a higher pressure than ventricles, which one's open? Chordae tendinae is the right word, yes. Good. So one, AV open, SL closed. Right, this pressure here, absolutely nowhere near that pressure there. Okay, number two, at the moment where the green line goes above the yellow line, which ones are open? Good. If your ventricular, um, pre in fact, actually, ooh, hold your horses. The ventricular pressure here is greater than the atrial pressure. Okay. So I haven't told you yet at this moment here, this, in fact, no, number three, yeah, number two was there. So sorry, I didn't actually do that. Uh, so yeah, at number two, so we're looking here, the ventricular pressure is greater than the atrial, but ventricular has not got to the aortic yet, right? So it hasn't got as high as the aortic. Right. So at the very start of ventricular systole, just before the pressure gets high enough, um, the AV are going to close. As soon as the pressure in the ventricles is higher than the atria, then the AV close. However, because the ventricles haven't got higher than the aortic yet, it means the semilunars are also closed. OK, this this green line has to be above this red line. OK. Uh, at number three, when the green line goes above the red line, what's going to happen? So when green goes above the red. Uh, 
Semi Lunar's open, lovely. So AV still closed. Semi Lunar's open. Uh, cool. Number four. So when the uh, aortic pressure is higher than ventricular, what's going to happen? Lucy, there's two lines because they're two different places. They're showing you the pressure in well, three different places. So if the pressure in the aorta is higher than the pressure in the ventricles, then the semilunars are going to close. And then um, because my green line is still above my yellow line, that means that the AV are also closed. Okay. Because the yellow line, basically, for the, for the AV to open, the yellow line has to be on top. So if that's the case, uh, that will happen. And for the semilunars to open, the green has to be above the red. Okay, that's a way to think about this if you're getting a bit stuck. Uh, so finally for five then, when my ventricular becomes lower than my atrial, it's gonna mean that my AV open and semilunars close. Do we only talk about valves when interpreting this graph? No, it depends what the question is, right? So it could be talking about blood flow, could be talking about valves, it could be talking about all sorts of things, right? So I've just done this in terms of the valves, but if you know what valves are open, you obviously know where blood's going. The AV is open, blood's going from atri uh, the atria to the ventricles. If a semilunar is open, it means blood's going from the ventricles out of the heart. Okay, uh, cool. So in terms of a heart rate then, to just go one step further and I'll give you an exam question, uh, I would expect every single one of you to know, can this just be memorized? Uh, Lucy, why memorize it when it's not too difficult? Right. All you need to remember, or you don't need to remember anything. You need to know that for blood to move somewhere, it needs to go from a high pressure to a low pressure. Fortunately, this graph is telling you where the pressure is higher. Right. If the pressure is higher in the yellow line, which is the atria, then you know that blood's going to move from atria to ventricles. If it's higher in the ventricles than it is in the, uh, the aorta, then blood's going to go from the ventricles out of the heart. Right, and you just need to remember it can't go backwards. So as opposed to memorizing this, remember that blood can only go forwards. And then basically just remember that it needs a pressure gradient to move. Uh, anyway, so what, what are we saying? So the heart muscles can't contract. Yeah, the heart muscles can contract, yes. Uh, anyway, how does the ventricular pressure continue to increase if all valves are closed? Uh, what well, here, um, because before, as it contracts, this is going to be like very, very, a very little amount of time, right? This will be less than a few milliseconds. So the pressure can increase and then that's what causes um, the valves to open. So the valves will remain closed until the pressure behind them is high enough to open them. Right. So anyway, um, are, the charge, are there charges on the valves? No, no charges. Valves, I think, Lucy, I think you're a bit confused. This is uh, a heart isn't something which is really charged or not charged, it's massive, right? Basically, think about it like a, a toothpaste, right? If you've got a big old toothpaste, that's a toothpaste. Um, if I've got a higher pressure on the inside, if I put a massive pressure on the inside, but the little caps on, none of the valves are open, nothing's gonna happen. If I have a really high pressure, even if I've got the cap on, if I make the pressure high enough, then this cap is going to blast off, which is my analogy to the valves opening, and then toothpaste is going to flow out, right? Can't go backwards because it can't really get back in. The dirty, that's not particularly funny. It's fine. It's a difficult topic. Um, so is that where di diastole occurs when the valves are closed? So is that where... I'm confused. So is that where diastole occurs when valves are closed? Is that where diastole? What do you mean? Thank you for my nice drawing. That is as good as toothpaste can get for me. So diastole just, just is the movement of blood into the heart when nothing contracts. Okay, uh, about 45 minutes to an hour. Right, I'm gonna move on. Does diastole occur when the valves are closed? Um, diastole will move in, but as soon as the atria fill with blood, the pressure gets higher. So they might be closed to begin with, but as soon as blood goes in, um, the AV valves are open. Anyway, I'm going to move on. So the heart is myogenic, which you guys should know, which means it beats by itself. It doesn't need anything to make it beat, it just beats. 
and there are some um, nerves that attach to it. So the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nerve or the vagus and the accelerator nerve, and they can control the rate and that's all connected up to the medulla oblongata, which I'm not gonna talk about um, particularly, apart from if, if your heart detects that there's too much carbon dioxide, the pH increases, uh, sorry, decreases, it becomes acidic and the heart rate increases to get rid of it. Um, but anyway, I'm not gonna get too into that. So essentially what happens then is for your heart to beat, you've got two nodes. You've got the sinoatrial node and the atrioventricular node. Um, what does the sinoatrial node do? Myogenic just means it beats by itself. Uh, this is A, S, and A2 at the moment now. So yeah, what does the, what does the sinoatrial node do? So acts as a pacemaker, lovely. What's it actually do though? It initiates a wave of excitation in the right atrium. Oh, couldn't have put it better than myself. Um, lovely. So the wave of excitation is produced, and by excitation, I just mean like an electrical activity, uh, is produced by the uh, SAN, the sinoatrial node. Okay, and essentially what happens is that wave of, uh, of excitation is going to start to spread all through the atria, right? And it's going to spread through this atria, it's going to go through all of the atria. Okay, so this will kind of reach the atria and what's it going to do to those atria? So as soon as the um, excitation is produced in the sinoatrial node, what's going to happen to the atria? Good, they contract. Now, someone mentioned earlier that this, the heart beats from the apex, and that is because the excitation can try and move down this way, right? The wave of excitation can try and move down here, but this bit here, this sort of side of the heart, this is all non and so it cannot conduct electricity. So non Conducting tissue prevents the ventricles from contracting. Okay, and instead, this wave of excitation hits this second node in the heart, which is called the AVN. So the wave of excitation hits this AVN. Right? And because it's all going into sort of the middle of the heart, there's a little bit of a pause. Right? And that pause is there just to make sure that all of the blood, which was in the uh, atria, has moved into the ventricles. Okay? So the atrioventricular node will produce its own wave of excitation and basically send it downwards. Okay? So atrioventricular node um, picks up wave. And we can say, um, causing a delay or something. Okay, so it's gonna receive this signal, there'll be a delay, and then it's gonna send a, a, a new sort of wave, so some more electrical activity, and it's gonna send them down these tissues down here. Does anyone know the names that we use to describe these? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, for those of you saying, uh, do you have to write these out? Just write it once and then put it in brackets after and then that's fine. Good. So this is called the bundle of Hiss, this bit here. And it's made up of a weird type of tissue called Purkinje fibers. No idea why it's pronounced like that. I think it's, it must be someone's name. But um, this bit, the septum of the heart is made of Purkinje fibers. And essentially they are collectively known as a bundle of Hiss. So the electrical activity um, is sent down the bundle of Hiss. And basically it separates into two little kind of forks, into two sort of, I don't know, branches, right? So the wave of excitation comes down to the bottom and then it goes up the side of the heart. And essentially this bit will contract very, very minutely first, then that bit, then that bit, right? So this way it allows the heart to pump from the bottom upwards which sends blood upwards. So ventricles contract. Upwards. Is this AQA? This is indeed AQA. Um, cool. So that's essentially how the heart is controlled. Okay, so we've gone through the different stages and then this is how it's controlled. This is every single exam board, uh, AQA, edXL, OCR, edXLB, all of them. All of you need to know this. Okay, so electrical activity made at the SAN. 
it will move through the atria to the AVN. There is a little pause that needs to get to this space first, allowing blood to move into the ventricles. Electrical uh, excitation can then move down the Purkinje fibres and then it causes the ventricles to contract at the same time just after the atria. Um, the medulla oblongata is just there to control the rate. So if it detects that there is a change in pH or carbon dioxide levels, uh, sorry, or pressure, then it can make it go a bit faster or a bit slower. The medulla is part of the brain, yeah. So there are some nerves connecting up to the brain. So you guys loved my drawing of toothpaste. There is a brain. There you go. So there's one nerve there, one nerve there. Let's say that's the medulla. Right, the medulla can control um, pretty well how fast your heart goes. So here is an exam question. How are you guys feeling before we get going out of interest? Feeling all right? Is this really easy? Is this really hard? Excellent, yeah, send me some ones, twos, and threes. Send me ones, twos, and threes, I like that. So one, great, two, nah, three, terrible. <laughs> Nice. You guys seem to get this a little bit. This is good. I'm intrigued what just happened. Hang on. No? Okay, no. I, my brain just stopped. Cool. Good. Right. Here is an exam question, man. So the graph shows the volume changes in the left ventricle of a human heart during two cardiac cycles. So the numbers one, two, three, and four represent times when the heart valves open or close. Uh, use information from the graph to complete the table in part A. Place numbers one, two, three, or four in the appropriate boxes. Okay, so let's have a look first. Even so, this is showing you the volume of the ventricles. So maybe it would be worth looking at this bottom one first. Okay, so if we have a heart, um, we need to know when will the ventricles open. The uh, sorry, the atrioventricular valves open. And then we need to think about when it will close as well. So maybe doing the open ones first is probably the easier bit. So what number are we going to assume is when the atrioventricular valve opens? Out of interest, what do you guys think? So when will the atrioventricular valve open? So ones, twos, threes, fours. And the volume increases. Okay, cool. So some of you again, there's some of you on. So in terms of the atrioventricular valve, right? So the atrioventricular valve is going to be this guy down here, right? I'm just going to do uh, the right hand side. This is going to open. It's going to open at the moment just before the volume in the ventricles begins to increase. So when do you see the volume increasing? So this is going to open just before the ventricles increase. So what one is the one just before the volume in the ventricles increases? Medulla oblongata is different to medulla. Guys, right, look at the graph. <laughs> Thank you. Right, so atrioventricular valve opens right here, right? Just before the volume of blood in the ventricle increases, this is when the atrioventricular valve has just opened. Okay, so... Just here then, looking at number two, which valve, what's got to have just happened for number two to open? So for number two to open, what's just happened? Big dummy. <laughs> totally different things that I'm getting from all of you. Increase in pressure, this doesn't really matter so much about pressure. There would be uh, an increase in pressure if the volume of the ventricle is just decreasing. So if, if I've got an amount of blood right here, if this amount of blood is suddenly just going to start to decrease, what's just happened? right? If the amount of blood is decreasing, where, how, it's got to be going somewhere. So what's got to have happened? For it to go anywhere, what's got to have happened? going back on itself. Good, I mean, enough of you have said it. So number two, right? If a blood is moving somewhere, which it is here and here, it means that something has just opened. So number two is where the semilunar opens, right? So semilunar opens here because that is the exact moment that it starts to move, okay? In terms of when they close then, 
if if my semi lunar has just opened here, was just closed at the same time. Yeah. So number one there and number three there. Right. So number one, AV has to close before the semi lunar can open. And then semi lunar has to close before. Ooh, whoops. My bad. So the semi lunar, was it semi lunar? Yeah. Semi lunar has to close just before I basically get the atrioventricular valve um, opening. No. My brain is just totally farted. So before, so this one, um, volume of ventricle increasing, that's got to be the atrioventricular valve opening. And just before it opens, the semi lunar has to close. Cool. Yes. Lovely. Um, okay, so use the diagram above to calculate the volume of blood pumped per minute by the left ventricle. How would you go about doing this? How can we work out the volume of blood being pumped per minute by the left ventricle? What numbers do I need to be looking at here? Cardiac output, no idea what that is. Stroke volume, no idea what that is here. So no, cannot use that. Minimum and maximum. No, nope, it's not asking me for cardiac output. It's asking me how much blood's moving. Right, so I know that a minute is 60 seconds. That's a good start. Time between the changes. Oh, good, lovely. So I need to look at the two peaks exactly like you would have done in physics um, when you did wave questions back in the day. Let's choose two bits which are exactly the same. So that bit there is exactly the same as that bit there. Okay, what is the time difference between those two bits? Can you be precise? So if you know that that's 0 0.4 and that's 0 0.6 and there are five squares in between, you should be able to work out what each little square is worth. <laughs> e physics. Come on, guys. Two, what does two mean? Two seconds. Oh, a square is 0 0.2, yeah. Each little square is 0 0.2 because it's, um, no, 0 0.02, because this whole gap here is 0 0.2 seconds divided by five squares equals 0 0.0, in fact, not 0 0.02, that's 0 0.04, is it not? Whereas my brain decided to give up on me altogether. Yeah, it's not giving up on me altogether, 0 0.04. My brain has given up on me. 0 0.04, yeah, what am I on about? Okay, so I'm going from this point here, so 0 0.44 to 0, so it's 0 0.48. And then what is this one here gonna be then? If I get rid of my little red splodge, I might make your life a bit easier. 1.84, no. 1.24, good. So 1.24. So the gap then is how many seconds? So 0.48 seconds to 0, uh, sorry, 1.24. So I've got a gap of 1.24. What was my gap, the distance in between those two? Yeah, 1.24 minus 0.48 equals 0.76. Okay, so that's how long it takes for one beat of the heart, right? I need to know how many beats there will be in 60 seconds. So how can I do that? So 0.76 seconds per beat. So 60 seconds divided by 60, good. 60 divided by 0.76 equals... Times in by 60 wouldn't work. 60 over 0 0.76 works. Good. So that equals 79 beats per minute. How much blood is moving for every beat? Hmm. Don't worry if you don't have a calculator. How much blood is moving? Very well done. Yeah. So 120 is the maximum. The heart always seems to have 40 in it, never below that. 120 minus 40 equals 80. 
So 80 centimeters cubed per beat, 79 beats, multiply those together. Point 0.8, bam. Okay, so watch out with your rounding. So on my mark scheme, uh, I have got any number between 6315 up to 6400. Zero, zero. Any number between those, you will get your marks. Okay, how many marks is that question? That would probably be about two marks. I don't know where my little number's gone. I'd say two marks, maybe three marks if you're lucky. 0 0.76 is how long it takes for one heartbeat. Yeah, so that's one heartbeat. 80 centimeters cubed came from 120 at the maximum, 40 at the minimum in terms of the amount of blood and the difference between the two. Only two marks. Yeah, probably only two marks. That's a pretty standard maths question, I'd say. <laughs> Do significant figures matter in biology? You tend to copy what they have given you. So if you've got 1.2, then do yours to one decimal place. Okay, that would be my standard rule. Where did 80 come from? I literally just said 120 minus 40. Why did I times them? Because I know that there's 79 beats per minute. I know that there's 80 centimeters cubed of blood getting pumped per beat. So 79 beats times by 80 equals 6,400. Because it's asking me for centimeters cubed per minute. The other question said, uh, calculate the volume of blood pumped per minute by the left ventricle. Where is 0 0.2 over five coming from? Because we need to work out how a graph works, right? So the gap is 0 0.4 to 0 0.6. And there are five little squares, so each little square is worth 0 0.04. And where does 79 come from? Because that's what we worked out, yeah? 0 0.76 is one beat, and there are 60 seconds in a minute. So if it takes 0 0.76 seconds to do one beat, and I'm looking at how many beats I'll be in 60 seconds, I need to do 60 over that. Okay, I'm going to move on to hemoglobin. So... Um, what do you guys know about hemoglobin? What is its structure like out of interest? That question was a little tricky, but pretty, pretty common, that kind of question. How do I change seconds into minutes? One minute is 60 seconds. Good. It's got a quaternary structure. What does quaternary structure mean? Good. It's got four iron groups, four heme groups. And it's got four polypeptides. What is the function of hemoglobin? What is the function of it? They are alpha and beta. Good. So it carries oxygen. And then what? Associates with oxygen, even better. So O2 association and... And it carries oxygen to the muscles, so it does what with it? Dissociation, lovely. Yeah, otherwise known as loading and unloading. Okay, so this is the thing that people get a bit confused about then, right? So if I've got hemoglobin, the same molecule acts differently in different partial pressures of oxygen. Now let's look at this word quickly first. Partial pressure basically just means concentration, right? It doesn't quite, it means it means like the gas pressure and basically what it's like, but for this, you can just imagine it means concentration. Saturation just means how much oxygen has bound to hemoglobin. So if I've got a very low partial pressure, if we just look at the adult for now, if I've got a very low partial pressure of oxygen, then not very much is binding. So hemoglobin is not very saturated, right? If I've got a high um, partial pressure of oxygen, so this could be somewhere like the lungs, then oxygen is gonna be 100% uh, saturated with hemoglobin. Hemoglobin, sorry, is 100% saturation. Um, hemoglobin, is, that's how the Americans spell it, for those who are wondering. So this graph is a bit weird. So it's not just a linear graph, right? Some people would expect the graph to look like this. So uh, PO2 and SO2 saturation. People would expect that as you increase oxygen, it saturates, but it doesn't. 
it actually shows an S shaped graph like that, otherwise known as a sigmoidal shaped curve. Okay. The reason for this, the reason for this is because at a uh, low partial pressure of oxygen, it's actually quite difficult for hemoglobin to bind. So hemoglobin, which I'm going to call from now on HB to save time, uh, it struggles to bind when there's a little bit of oxygen present. Okay, so HB binds slowly to begin with. Okay, um, essentially what happens when oxygen binds, what happens to it? Someone has said, Lucy, uh, it causes it to change shape um, oh, actually not quite. So as soon as one oxygen binds, what happens? Saturation just means how much oxygen is stuck to it. There is a conformational change. So hemoglobin binds slowly to begin with. However, one, bind, one bound changes the shape. Okay, so one hemoglobin bound will change its shape. Okay, so that will happen about here. Okay. As soon as that's happened, um, the other two, the next two, bind easily. And you end up having um, a, a very little partial pressure change. If you compare this line here and there to this line here, which is about the same gap, if anything, it's smaller, right? A big change in partial pressure here causes very little saturation. Right? Whereas the same sort of distance change here, you go from a 25, it goes from zero to about 25%. Whereas this same gap here, when it's easily binding, I go from 25 up to about 75. So there's about a 50% change in saturation here compared to only a 25% here. So the next two bind easily, meaning that a small change in partial pressure has a massive change in the saturation. And then the final one binds slowly, just due to chance. Okay, the reason that I say by chance is because if my hemoglobin looking like this has had one oxygen bind there, one oxygen bind there and one bind there, well, as soon as another oxygen tries to bind, if it tries to bind there, that one's already taken. If it binds there, already taken, there, already taken, the only place it can bind is there. So it's just not very likely to hit the right spot. Okay. So the final oxygen binds slowly, which is why it begins to go S-shaped again and it slows down because uh, it's basically hard for the last oxygen to find the right place. Okay. Um, yeah. So someone mentioned this. Okay. So the weird thing with hemoglobin, the weird thing with hemoglobin is different organisms have very slightly different hemoglobin. So a fetus, as in the thing that lives inside of you if you were pregnant is different if you are um, an adult, right? So for the adult, if we have a look, uh, I'm gonna ignore these dashed lines here and I'm gonna draw my own line, okay? If I compare an adult and a fetus at the same partial pressure, which is about 35, how saturated is the adult compared to the fetus? Myoglobin too, you are all right. How uh, saturated is the adult compared to the fetus? Have a look, look at the graph. Look at the adult, adult is here. Fetus is here. So the adult is less saturated than the fetus, okay? Now that's important because if you are a fetus, there is less oxygen surrounding you. So if you are a fetus, there is less oxygen surrounding you. So you need to try and get as much as possible. Okay, so different hemoglobins um, allow organisms at low O2 levels to get enough oxygen. Okay, so you could say that their hemoglobin has a high affinity to oxygen. Okay, if I were to compare another organism, so if I were to put something like a rodent, like a mouse here, then as opposed to being shifted to the left, because this curve shifted to the left for a fetus, 
there you go um it actually shifts to the right so if i do the same thing if i compare 35 and draw a line up here which is the wonkiest line i think i've ever drawn in my life um ham. there you go if i'm comparing my adult human adult to this uh i don't know mouse right the mouse is much less saturated why is that the case why do you want um if you've got a high metabolism why do you want to have a lower saturation you need more oxygen yes so therefore what yeah you need more oxygen for respiration therefore what do you want hemoglobin to do It needs to dissociate it, exactly. So, uh, allows organisms at low oxygen levels to get enough oxygen, they have a high affinity, and allows organisms with high metabolism to unload oxygen to tissues because they have a low affinity, right? Now this seems really counterproductive and loads of students get confused with this. So if I get rid of that conk. So basically, if it's shifted to the right, it means that you are better at getting rid of oxygen. So at the same level, the same partial pressure, right? The saturation is lower. That means you are unloading oxygen, you're dissociating oxygen. If you are shifted to the left, it means that the same partial pressure you have a greater saturation, which means you are better at getting oxygen. Okay, what does it mean high affinity? High affinity means it's able to bind to as much as possible. Low affinity means it's not. So I'll rephrase that one more time then, yeah? So if you are a little rodent, you want to be shifted to the right because at the same partial pressure, the same partial pressure, the saturation is low which means that you can release oxygen to tissues. If you are a fetus and there's not a lot of oxygen, then you are shifted to the left of the normal one, of the, of the adult one, because of the same partial pressure, you want to get as much oxygen as possible. <coughs> it needs a high affinity to get as much oxygen as possible. What does rodent mean? Really? Rodents are like little mouse things. Uh, you have to talk about oxyhemoglobin. You don't have to, but yes, if there's oxygen attached, it is um, oxyhemoglobin. Low affinity, more active. Exactly me. That is exactly right. Rodents are small mass. Okay. Um, yeah, one other thing then I can mention, and then I'm probably going to finish a little uh, ahead of time, is uh, the same thing. If you have carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide works a very similar way. So a high level of carbon dioxide, you shift to the right. So if this is more CO2, you want it to have um, more dissociation, can't say word, dissociation? No, brain. I don't want to say dissociation. Do I want to say dissociation? Why has my brain just stopped working? Dissociation, yeah, that, that is definitely the right word. Anyway, um, when you've got more CO2, there is more dissociation happening because more CO2 probably means that you're in a tissue, right? You're in a respiring tissue that's making carbon dioxide in uh, aerobic respiration, okay? So more CO2 equals an even lower affinity, and it means that there's more unloading happening. It was the coffee, yeah. This is definitely the thing that caused that. Okay, um, right, last question then, and then I'm gonna finish. In fact, no, I won't. Those of you who want to do this question, YouTube people, it's very, very easy. Uh, this question, describe the relationship between size and oxygen association. Basically, um, smaller, is going to mean that it is shifted in a certain direction. Um, so smaller equals shifted to the right, that's all you had to say. Use the information to explain relationship between surface area to volume ratio of mammals and oxygen association. Basically, small equals um, high surface area. Don't know why I've done that. Uh, surface area to volume ratio. Guys, have a go at doing this question, I would say. Um, by yourself, I'll tell you the answer, but have a look at it properly. High surface area to volume ratio, um, which equals heat loss, which equals a high metabolism needed to make sure you're still hot, which means hemoglobin um, with a low affinity needed. Okay.
have a look about yourselves. I promise you that will hopefully make some sense. Um, right, I need to tell you something. So as those of you know, um, we are doing some seminars in the not too distant future. So for those of you that uh, don't know about this, and I assume most of you do because these adverts pop up all the time, um, I'm gonna be doing some lectures basically. Look, there I am, hello. Um, and I'll be doing a year 12 crash course and a year 13 crash course. And let's just look at the year 12 one for now. Um, essentially what I'll be doing is I'll be going over protein, cell division, mass transport in plants and in animals. So some more of this stuff. And I'll be doing loads of Q&A sessions. Um, I'll be doing exam technique sessions, uh, just so you guys actually know how to answer questions. And this is going to be in London in Imperial College. So for those of you that are interested in going to uni, it'd probably be quite cool to have an idea of what a lecture is like. And someone asked earlier, is this gonna be very similar to this? I guess it's gonna be quite similar, but not totally the same because with lectures, it's gonna be more me talking and less of me answering questions. But for that reason, uh, we'll have something set up so you can message questions to some other tutors who will be in the room. Um, the tickets are expensive, as you'll see. However, education's really, really expensive, unfortunately. Um, when you go to uni, I think it's probably gonna be like nine and a half grand, which works out about 50 pounds per lecture. So compared to that, that's actually pretty cheap. Um, but anyway, there are biology ones, there are chemistry ones, maths and physics. So if any of you who are interested, um, oh, and if you go to more than one as well, I'm pretty sure you get a discount. But have a look at this. If you are wanting to do something to boost your confidence, this could possibly be it. Um, otherwise, you guys should now know uh, how the cardiac cycle occurs, diastole, atrial systole, ventricular systole, should know the structure of the heart, and you should know how hemoglobin is used to transport oxygen. Uh, what's next week's session? Next week's session, I'm gonna go over epistasis and the Hardy-Weinberg principle. What deg degree did I do? I did biology for my degree, for my first degree. Oh, I probably should have said, these are all in April as well, these sessions. But anyway, um, yeah, next, next session is going to be, uh, Wednesday, always Wednesday. Yeah, and tutors cost an absolute fortune. Yeah, when I used to be a tutor, I used to tutor maths, which is weird because I don't have a degree in maths. Um, but I used to tutor maths and I used to charge about 40 pounds per session, just so you know, that was for an hour. Whereas this is gonna be about six hours of solid. <sighs> yeah. Anyway, yeah, have a lovely afternoon, guys. Um, oh, I'm really glad, Jackie, that's really cool. <laughs> that's actually quote of the day, Jackie, if I could, in fact, I'm going to screenshot exactly what you've just said. That's just made my day. Hmm. Awesome. Right. Have a lovely afternoon, guys, and I will catch you later. See you later.